In this video, we're going to focus on calculating the p-value for a hypothesis test on one proportion, and we'll look at two different examples for this, so hopefully you kind of understand how to identify whether the test statistic is a lower bound or an upper bound if you're using the TCDF function on your calculator or even looking it up in a table. So this is following from a couple previous examples that I've done in other videos, uh, and we're going to start with example one. So example one says that an advertising company claims that more than 83% of people read advertisements on billboards. And so we took a random sample of 100 people and found that 85 out of those 100 people said they did read the advertisements on billboards. We've already gone through and we calculated the test statistic and stated the null and the alternative hypothesis. Both of those are given below. So before I get started on calculating the p-value, one of the things I want to do is help you think about this and visualize this in terms of pictures. We're using the standard normal distribution in order to draw this um, or think about this in terms of a picture and I'll try my best to draw it pretty neat. But our standard normal distribution is that nice uh, bell-shaped curve that looks something like this. This is our, on the scale of z, our z-value. And the mean of the standard normal distribution is zero. Now, when we take a look at our, our test statistic on that uh, z-scale right there, I'm just going to say that um, our test statistic is probably about right here. I'm going to say that this is 0.5 right there. So that's our test statistic and that's equal to 0 0.532. Now our p-value represents the area either to the left of this line or to the right of this line, but that p-value and that area that we're after really depends on what the symbol is in h sub a. So if we go back and we look at our alternative hypothesis, you can see that this is a greater than symbol right here. That greater than symbol is indicating that I wanna find the area to the right of that test statistic. So I want to find this area right here. So that is going to represent my p-value. And the way that we can calculate what that is, is there's a function on our calculator that's called the normal CDF function. And we have to use that information to determine whether that's our lower bound or upper bound. Um, there are other ways that we can use or calculate our p-value. We could use the standard normal table. That definitely works, but I'm going to focus on using um, the, the normal CDF function for that. So our p-value, I'm just going to label p for this, and um, we're going to use what, like I said before, the normal CDF function. And in that normal CDF function, there's a few inputs that we have to figure out. We have our lower bound, which I'm going to abbreviate LB. We have our upper bound, which is going to be UB. We have our mean mu and our standard deviation sigma. Now, when we're dealing with the normal distribution, mu and sigma are always going to be 0 and 1 respectively. So in this case, I would use normal, CDF, and 0 and 1 are going to be my mean and my standard deviation. The thing that I need to figure out is what is our lower bound and our upper bound? So when we look at this picture, we want the area from this z value to the right. So when we look at that, this is going to be our lower bound, and we want to go to the right to uh, find our upper bound. So our lower bound is pretty self-explanatory. That's going to be 0.532 because that's a lower value on the, on the z-scale. Now our upper bound, technically this curve goes um, to infinity without ever crossing the horizontal axes. So technically our upper bound would be positive infinity. And I just like to emphasize that we're using a large number. So I use the value 1 million whenever I talk about the upper bound in this case. So that's going to be a positive 1 million. And I know these are a little misaligned right there because I wrote those earlier. But anyways, um, that would be the inputs for our normal CDF function. And if you go on your, your TI-83 or TI-84 graphing calculator, you would hit the second button and the VARES button. And that'll open up the distribution menu and you'll find the normal CDF function in there. And when you select that, it'll ask you what your lower bound is, your upper bound, your mean, and your standard deviation. Those will always stay constant for what we're doing with this hypothesis test right there. And when you plug those into your calculator and work that out, you're going to end up with a p-value equal to 0 0.2972. Now, I want to mention with a p-value real quick. With p-values, the larger the p-value, 
the less likely we are to reject our null hypothesis. And we typically use the decision rule. I'm using the p-value approach. We would say, well, if our p-value is less than or equal to our alpha value, our level of significance, then we're going to reject our null hypothesis. Typical values for the level of significance, the alpha value, are 0.1 or 0.5 or 0.1. Those are some of the typical ones. And you can see that 0.29 is much larger than any of those. So in this case right here, we're gonna fail to reject the null hypothesis based on that p-value. And I have another video that actually shows a full hypothesis test work, worked out. I would take a look at that and that'll help explain it. Now I have another example that's slightly different than what we just looked at. And this one deals with a bead company. And so this company manufactures these, these various beads and they say that 25% of the beads in their bucket are actually blue. And then we'd like to investigate this and determine if the actual proportion of blue beads in the bucket is different than 25% on average. So we went out, we took a random sample of 160 beads and found that 26 of those beads were blue. And we want to use this information to calculate our p-value. Now I gave the hypothesis statements right here and you can see the null hypothesis is p is equal to 0.25 and the alternative is p is not equal to 0.25 or p is different than 0.25. And the test statistic, I calculated this separately. You'll just have to trust me that that's the correct uh, test statistic. And now we have to calculate our p-value. So let's take a look at this graphically and kind of think about what this is telling us right there. All right, so we have our, our z or our standard normal distribution right here. I know it's not the best picture, but it'll work. So this is z. The mean of the z distribution is zero. The middle of that is going to be zero. And this time we have this test statistic of negative 2.556. This is quite a ways to the left of zero. So I'm just going to place that right here for our test statistic. This is our value of z, which equals negative 2.556. All right, that's supposed to be a negative in front of that. I'll try to sneak that in there. All right, because otherwise it looks like that's a continuation of it. Okay. So hopefully that, that makes sense right there. Now, in this case, we have this not equal to sign right there. So it's hard to tell which direction that we're going to be shading to the left of that line or to the right of that line. Now, in general, what I tell my students is we're gonna shade to the closest tail. Now, the, in actuality, that not equal to sign right there really implies this, a not equal to sign implies that it's something different than 0.25. So, that, that value of 0.25, it could be smaller than 0.25 or it could be larger than 0.25. So that's kind of a, a, a compact notation for saying that our population proportion is smaller than 0.25 or it's larger than 0.25. In this case, our test statistic ends up on the left, so we're really looking at that case where it's smaller than that value. So we want this area right here. That's gonna be part of our p-value, and I'll explain a little bit more in just a little while. So to calculate our p-value, just like before, we're gonna use that normal CDF function. Now with our normal CDF function, just recall that our mean is zero and our standard deviation is one. I'm writing those down at the end. We have to determine whether this is a lower bound or an upper bound. In this case, it happens to be the upper bound because we want the area to the left of this. So this would mean that our lower bound is on the left and that makes this our upper bound right there. All right, so we're finding that area right there. So always think of the lower bound as the leftmost value and the upper bound is the rightmost value. So in this statement right here, we can see that our lower bound is gonna be way to the left, our upper bound is going to be the right. So this value of negative 2.556 is going to be our upper bound. The lower bound, since this goes for infinity, in the towards the left or negative infinity, our lower bound, I'm gonna use a really, really small value like negative one million. So we'll use that for our lower bound. And then our upper bound is going to be negative 2.556 and our mean is going to be zero, our standard deviation is one. So again, if we use our graphing calculator to uh, find that normal CDF function, we would just hit the second button and hit the VARES button you'll see that the normal CDF function is there. And then we type these values in, make sure you don't use the minus sign, make sure you use the negative sign, which is down by the decimal point. And you plug those in, we'll come up with a value um, of approximately 0 
five three. Now, one thing I want to talk about that I didn't talk about just yet is this statement, this or statement right here. If you remember from probability, or means addition. So really, we have to treat this as though our test statistic could be negative or it could be positive and we want that right tail as well. So one way, is that, one way that we deal with this when we have a two tail test is we take and we multiply this by two because we have two tails that we're looking at, hence the not equal to sign right there. So we have to actually double this value right here to get our official P value. So this really represents this area that I have is really our P value divided by two. That's not our full P value right there. So when we double that, we end up with a value of 0 0.0106 is our official P value. Now, if you recall what I said before, typical alpha values are like 0 0.1, 0 0.05, or 0 0.01. And when we talk about P values, the smaller the P value is, the more likely we are to reject our null hypothesis. So in this case right here, I have a pretty small P value, so there's a pretty good chance I'm going to be re rejecting my null hypothesis. For right now, I just wanted to focus on how we calculate that p-value and where that comes from and look at two different scenarios where we could uh, see how we use that alternative hypothesis in order to help us determine whether that test statistic is a lower bound or an upper bound, and then also whether or not we have to double that or not. So hopefully this helps you with understanding the p-value and calculating the p-value uh, when you're doing hypothesis testing on one proportion.